What's up guys? Helen here wondering how long it's been since I partied, shared a drink, or just hugged somebody I don't live with. Of course, if you're a resident of the Hype House, the answer is five seconds ago. And also, you just stuck your tongue in a stranger's mouth. Indeed, amidst the cultural backlash of the pandemic, a certain class of famous people, online influencers, have reached new heights of media attention simply by refusing to stay the hell home. But even before the unplandemic hit, online influencers have been steadily dabbing, lip syncing, unboxing, and pranking their way into increasingly bigger spotlights, all while rewriting the rules of 21st century celebrity. They're often dismissed as not deserving fame, or being grossly self-promoting, or for being very bad people who are officially uninvited to my birthday party. But as TikTok star Charlie D'Amelio's recent ascendance to the big screen of the Dunkin' Donuts menu proves, that's not stopping them. So how did we end up here? What's the deal? Are influencers just a slightly different form of celebrity? Or is something more nefarious going on? Let's find out in this Wisecrack edition on influencers. What went wrong? But first, in true influencer fashion, we wanted to do a little self-promo. Right now, you can grab the t-shirt I'm wearing and a bunch of other cool designs on the Wisecrack store. We just did a big update, so even if you visited before, now's the time to check it out. We have dad hats, long sleeves, t-shirts, and even these funky mugs. Rep your fave philosophy channel in style by visiting wisecrack.store or hitting the first link in the description. We appreciate your support and hope you like the new merch. Now, back to the show. This might not be a shocker, but fame is not new. There's something unique about how fame became live streaming yourself, lighting your mattress on fire, or terrorizing the people of Tokyo with an octopus tentacle. And to figure out why, we need to talk about this guy. Alexander III of Macedon, or as you know him, Alexander the Great. This fourth century king was great not because he dropped 200 racks on this car at the age of nine, but instead because he created the world's largest empire in just 13 years. But as scholar Leo Brody writes in his book, the frenzy of renown, fame and its history, that's not why we still know his name. It's because he was the first famous person. How did this smelly warrior rise above all the kings before and after him? While our boy Alex had an almost superhuman craving for more land, he also had the cunning to know that the most valuable real estate was in the minds of those he ruled. He was obsessed with carefully cultivating his reputation, claiming to be descended from the gods, and modeling himself after the brave warriors from Homer's poetry. In Athens, he was officially named a god, and not just in a Morgan Freeman kind of way. And in some ways, Alexander nailed the basics of fame that persist to this day. Like Billy McFarland inviting hot people to Firefest Island, Alexander understood the importance of visual representation. That's always been crucial to fame, because if people are gonna worship you, they generally have to know approximately what you look like. If you're tracking the evolution of celebrities, it helps to look at the visual mediums that defined them in the public eye. Alexander was super picky about how he was portrayed visually, only allowing his three favorite artists to depict him from life. They typically did so in a way that evoked Helios, the sun god, because ancient Greece wasn't the time for modesty. And whereas coins were once the exclusive realm of gods and mythical heroes, Alexander was the first to stamp his own pretty face on currency. So sure, Alexander was a legend, but he was also kind of a regular dude who ate with his troops and fought alongside them. This is another theme we'll see throughout our history of fame. Famous people are often larger than life, yet also relatable folks you can share a beer or a goblet with. His legacy as a conqueror was cemented as he spawned the first ever wave of biographic books. Here was a guy whose story was truly worth telling. But Alexander wasn't alone in his early fame. Ancient Greek and Roman culture was full of fame-hungry folks doing impressive things to inspire poets to write about them. But in Rome, in particular, everything was about performance and leading a public life, in the name of personal glory and civic duty. The writer Cicero even tried to pen an epic poem about himself. Deeply charismatic Roman leader Julius Caesar outdid the rest with his obsession with triumphant parades and elaborate gladiator shows. What's more, Caesar was the first soldier to write a narrative war memoir, and apparently, as he lay dying, rearranged his toga as one final act of image control. Now, Caesar was not an influencer selling his bathwater. That we know of. That's partly because consumer society was still a millennia or two away. And at this time, celebrity was mostly about big men doing big things. You know, conquering and leading and so forth. 
But as cultures changed, so would fame. And keep in mind, fame hasn't consistently been in vogue. That's thanks mostly to this guy, who switched things up in the first century AD by living humbly, avoiding publicity, and promising mad glory in the afterlife. Naturally, celebrity culture took a bit of a dip, but certainly didn't disappear. And fame would eventually smash through the confines set by Christianity and further expand beyond kings and rulers with the Renaissance. See, the Renaissance brought the rise of portrait painting and the printed page, both of which began circulating images of people all over Europe. This moment was all about the individual, and with that, his or her fame. As Brody puts it, everyone who made a career in public was being made to realize how both art and printing could make him more symbolic, more essential, and more powerful. What's more, portraits seem to scratch that itch that everyone has to be remembered and to have their individual essence captured. As Leon Battista Alberti wrote in the 15th century, the face of a man who is already dead certainly lives a long life through painting. This frenzy meant the rise of more and more people being memorialized with a paintbrush. The best example, though, still comes from a monarch. Queen Elizabeth I of England, who was self-consciously curating her brand more than 400 years before you downloaded Visco. In a turbulent time, Elizabeth fiercely controlled her own image, sending out pre-approved portraits all over the kingdom to be copied by artisans. She even issued a proclamation to have all unapproved paintings destroyed, though it apparently wasn't enforced. While monarchs weren't sponsored by Red Bull, the, uh, bold fashion choices of royalty certainly trickled down through the aristocracy. If the Renaissance expanded access to fame beyond kings and queens, the 18th century absolutely exploded it. The combined French and American revolutions trumpeted the democratic man, and a slew of such men, like the Founding Fathers, were thoroughly obsessed with their legacy. Likewise, post-revolutionary war Americans were eager to celebrate them, with dumb legends like that cherry tree thing. In America, celebrity has always been far more democratic centering itself around the individual who seemed to possess that special spark. A spark which, simultaneously, the spectator could believe that they too possess. And so, not unlike any given selfie challenge, portraits depicted the so-called democratic man, via images like this of the low-key homely Ben Franklin. Meanwhile, books, pamphlets, portraits, and caricatures circulated like mad, bringing ever more faces and writings to the masses, and providing ever more avenues for fame. Concurrently, fandom as we know it really started to begin. As philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau grumpily recounted, people who had never read his books would come from miles away to gab with the man famous for his intellect, strangeness, and striking adoption of Armenian fashion. Needless to say, Rousseau never enjoyed these conversations. Still, imitating the look of your favorite French philosopher wasn't possible for most people. Until the 19th century, when the Industrial Revolution brought the fast, cheap mass production of imagery and of ready-made clothes, shoes, cigarettes, etc. Fashion suddenly took on a whole new layer, that of personal identity. And folks often dress to impress by copying images of famous people. They get their hair cut like Lord Byron, or wear gloves like Prime Minister Benjamin Disraeli. Uncoincidentally, this brought about, first, the rise of the dandy, due to dress like famous aristocrats even though they often weren't, and second, a huge number of people being brought to insane asylums for claiming to be Napoleon. Still, when it came to fame, the most profound change of this century was the arrival of photography, which democratized the right to see your own sexy mug on paper. It's said that Lincoln credits his success as much to a widely circulated photograph of him as he did to any awesome speech he ever gave. The photograph made him both accessible and someone to emulate. The simultaneous rise of journalism provided a place to celebrate the newly anointed masses of the famous, and the arrival of gossip columns let you find out what your favorite general was eating or what snarky things he was saying about his enemies. In this way, by the end of the 19th century, celebrity had basically stopped being primarily about heroic achievements like in Alexander the Great's case, and started to really be about identity, how that identity is expressed, and how it can be mimicked by adoring fans. Like when Queen Victoria popularized a poofy white wedding dress that for some inexplicable reason is still with us today. At this point, there were more ways to become famous than ever before, but one development would blow our concepts of celebrity out of the water, the rise of the motion picture. 
While early film actors weren't even named in the credits, it only took 14 years for a bona fide star system to form. Whereas theater actors had been achieving various amounts of fame since the 16th century, the movie actor was something different. Projected on a giant screen, their emotions and their individuality were far more accessible, and people fell instantly in love. Much the way they would with YouTube star and pathological tattoo collector Justin Bieber. For much of Hollywood history, most famous stars were women, and they were mostly naturalistic performers, appearing to portray themselves on screen and portraying sensationalized versions of themselves in the gossip columns. As a result, the connection between an early movie fan and their favorite star was intimate, almost possessive. It's no wonder that movie stars soon began to have their clothes ripped by mobs of rabid fans. What's more, because anybody can technically play themselves, movies made the most glamorous kind of celebrity seem like it was just one killer audition away, further democratizing our collective concept of fame. According to movie critic and author Ty Burr, above all, the movies propagated the idea that you didn't really matter unless you were seen. And seen, they were. Charlie Chaplin emerged as one of the first worldwide recognizable faces, his transcontinental railway tour attracting mobs of adoring fans. Notably and uniquely, Charlie made eye contact in his films, as if to emphasize his own accessibility to the audience. Still, most movie stars were both relatable and inaccessible in their glamour, people you could go to the theater and dream of emulating. And as they did, consumer spending and the leisure industry exploded, as more and more people used commodities and personal style to imitate the stars. This wasn't some random byproduct. Consumption is key to the idea of the modern celebrity. As P. David Marshall puts it, celebrity taught generations how to engage and use consumer culture to make oneself. This was literalized in the form of celebrity endorsement, which began to really boom in the 1920s. Subsequently, every development that affected the film industry, from the rise of the talking picture, to the rise of People magazine, to the rise of Hell on Earth, has brought stars closer to us, making them more accessible. But perhaps nothing changed the possibilities of celebrity more than this. Good thing you turned on that TV, Lisa. That's right, the television. While the big screen bred reliably glamorous stars, TV, which rapidly took over America, provided the space for a different kind of celebrity. The TV star was even more accessible and democratized. The regularity of television programs bred familiarity, intensifying the sense that you really know the star as a person. Most emblematic of early TV fame is Lucille Ball, a then B-list movie actress who was a non-Hollywood approved 40 years old when her show started. I Love Lucy was about a woman who wanted to be a star. Thus, as Burr explains, it explored the distance between the average person and fame, and the pain of that desire for celebrity coming up short. Such themes were doubtless very relatable to an America still absorbing the implications of Hollywood fame. But as TV contributed to the destruction of the studio system, we also saw the parallel rise of new Hollywood and with it, the quote-unquote common man in film, exemplified by the likes of Dustin Hoffman and Gene Hackman. We'd come a long way since the most famous people were kings and queens. As fame became entirely about being watchable, celebrity became an accessible dream for anyone with that special something. But the single biggest step in this process may have been the arrival of reality television. Developed in the late 1980s when TV studios were slashing costs, reality TV emerged as a cheap production model that banked on nameless talent. But by the early aughts, it was dominating the medium, beginning a cycle of everyday people being made famous before being cast aside for the next set of freshly tanned faces. If a glamorous silent movie star inspired the desire to imitate, and a more accessible Lucy inspired relatability, Reality TV inspired a more total identification with the stars in front of us. They, formerly nobodies, were now somebodies on our screens. They exemplified the paradox of celebrity, being extraordinary while being totally ordinary. And unlike being born the son of Philip of Macedon, anyone could allegedly end up being famous. I met him through a good mutual friend of mine. A grinder. But most importantly, reality TV confirms the suspicions each of us secretly harbors, that we deserve fame too, and what's more, that we could achieve it, if only we could dance, sing, or sit in a giant block of ice in a compelling way. 
Scholar Mark Andreevic argues that, ironically, the increased democratization of fame acted as a convenient collective fantasy during a time of increasing economic inequality. The idea that we could strike it rich on The Voice was a cheery antidote to the fact that we can barely afford rent. But before fame could turn into watching Tana Mojo self-immolate at her dumb bootleg VidCon, there was still one step left. We had to not only aspire to celebrity, we had to become obsessed with the process of celebrity making. You know, like watching a viral star shoot to fame before ruining his young career by making fun of a dead guy in a forest. Bro, did we just find a dead person in the suicide forest? And then watching the train wreck of that person continually trying to revive their career with PR stunts. This is what scholar Tim Mole calls a hypertrophic celebrity culture. That is to say, a culture in which we're far more obsessed with, say, the process of the Pauls or the Kardashians becoming famous, and the mechanisms of how they achieve that fame, than we are with any one particular celebrity. This process is literally baked into the model of most popular reality shows, like American Idol or The Voice or America's Next Top Model, and so on. In this era, celebrities like the Kardashians become more admired for their shrewd image control, for how they handle and enhance their celebrity, than for any other talents or abilities. I still don't understand how Paris Hilton got so famous, but by asking that very question, I'm probably contributing to this hypertrophic celebrity culture. Of course, watching the process of a normie or a hotel heiress become a capital C celebrity got a lot easier with the widespread use of the internet and later, social media. Since then, college student Jennifer Ringley finagled a so-called Jenny cam that took pictures of her room every three minutes, basically inventing vlogging, the internet has increasingly become a space for staging our everyday lives. Even more so than the idea that anyone is one audition away from fame, the internet has brought us the idea that anyone is one TikTok or vlog away from the highest echelons of internet stardom. The internet also offers the potential for the micro-celebrity. That is, someone who is extremely famous to a very specific group of people, like makeup or gaming enthusiasts. Whereas we've always suspected that film stars were playing a perhaps heightened version of themselves on screen, internet stardom is predicated on a strangely performative sense of authenticity. Fittingly, some of the biggest stars of the internet era, from the Paul brothers to the Mojo sisters, are ordinary, everyday people who happen to be good at playing themselves and happen to become famous for it. Because of this supposed authenticity, more so than any celebrity before them, influencers cultivate an intense parasocial relationship with fans. That is, a one-sided relationship in which the fan gives love, likes, and emotional investment, while the famous guy gives very little in return other than an occasional thank you to my fans. Authenticity, plus the strength of the parasocial relationship, happens to make influencers, perhaps more so than glamorous movie stars, excellent salespeople, particularly when it comes to chicken nugget pillows. It's no wonder every corporation from Adidas to McDonald's has taken note. Fittingly, influencers are also the embodiment of this hypertrophic celebrity culture, where your success at achieving fame, in the form of views or followers or a movie deal, becomes far more impressive and fascinating than any actual talents you may possess. That's why every influencer seems to inevitably celebrate earning 1 million followers by doing something loony. As a culture, we're fascinated by this form of fame, precisely because it seems to be just one successful Instagram post away the logical extension of the democratization of fame that's been going on since the Renaissance. Celebrity was once an aspiration to go down in history for your deeds, or to improve your city's standing, or to secure your kingship. Today, fame, and the spending habits it can provoke amongst fans, is the point, in and of itself. This can lead some click-hungry influencers to make some very dumb choices. Every evolution in media has made us collectively more visible. Being seen by millions has never felt more accessible or more important. That's likely to continue. And just as the photograph allowed more people than ever to become more visible, and thus more famous than ever, it's never been easier to get eyeballs on your face. However, with each subsequent rise in the number of celebrities, the entire concept of celebrity starts to become devalued and eye-roll inducing. Basically, more celebrities means fewer have staying power and nearly all are fated to quickly become passé in a process that is either sad or sadly funny depending on how much of a jerk you are. Now, we're not saying to quit posting to your dog's Instagram, but do it for the joy of sharing Vandal's sexy mug, not with the hope of landing her a deal with Puppy Chow. But what do you guys think? 
Is the contemporary form of celebrity making us all fame-crazed monsters? Or is the democratization of fame actually empowering, even if your last TikTok only got 540 views? Let us know in the comments. Thanks to our patrons for all your support, stamp that subscribe button like it's your star on the walk of fame, and as always, thanks for watching. Peace.